It's freaking light in the background. <clears throat> Can I position myself so that it's right behind me? That's the question. What's up? What's up? How's it going, everybody? You know what? I'm going to shut this light off. Hold on one second. There we go. There we go. What's up? What's up, everybody? Let me know in the chat if you can hear me. What's up? What's up? Hair is crazy right now. Got to get the haircut tomorrow. Loud and clear. All right. While people are trickling in, as we do with every hops with pop, it's been a while. Man, I think we've done one of these since was a draft schedule release, something like that. But I've been busy grinding, training camp, practice reports, big brain and Staley feature, analytics feature that came out. So I've had a lot of work to do, but can't forget about the people here. We are drinking pie of the tiger, key lime pie sour from Full Circle Brewing in Alameda, California. Actually, correction, Fresno, California. For full circle brewing. Let's give it a taste. I literally just cracked it. Okay. Always got to do two sips. All right. Interesting. Okay. They do definitely get the key lime flavor in there. A little bit of creaminess. Oh, yes. It's a little. Okay. It says it's brewed with a little vanilla. So that's where you get that from. Solid. Not my favorite sour I ever had. But, you know. Beer's beer at the end of the day. I think people have seen me drink. What, what I, I drink Bud Light on here one time. We drink whatever. Whatever they got, we're drinking. So training camp is over. So people are trying to trickle in here. I think we're good enough to get going here. Everyone, let me know in the chat what you're drinking. What are we drinking? End of training camp. 19 practices down. And training camp is over. So cheers to that. It's a long, long training camp. It's a grind. But we made it through. What's everybody drinking? Little Coors Light. Love that. Buffalo Trace. I've got my own Buffalo Trace here that I'm going to crack open after I get off of this. I think I did bourbon for one hops with pop and it got, uh, got off the rails a little bit. I think that was the last time I ever – it was a one and only, one and done. With the bourbon on hops with pop. It is hops with pop after all, so you gotta get the hops going. We got some land sharks, we got some Sierra Nevada liquid hoppiness IPA. I don't I haven't had that Sierra Nevada one. One of my favorite IPAs is Sierra Nevada. Um celebration IPA. It's like a it, they release it around Christmas time. It's freaking delicious. Jose Cuervo Gold, love that. Protein smoothie, brain dust IPA. I think I've had that before. A little modello. Flying Fish Brewery. I love IPAs. Free Ride Pale Ale from Alaskan. Ah, shots with pop. Yeah, if we want to party, we can do that. All right, we got some people in here. Welcome back to Hops with Pop, everybody. I hope everyone's excited to be here. I'm certainly excited to be chatting with you guys again. It's been a minute. Um, as I was saying earlier, training camp is complete. Um, if you are not subscribed to The Athletic, I have a practice report from every single day. And more importantly, last week I released a feature that I've been working on for like 10 months on how Brandon Staley and the Chargers use analytics, their thought process. It's all of the details is behind the scenes. If you have not read that, click the link below and subscribe through that story. Um, everyone in the chat, if you've read the story, let everyone know. Um, I put a ton of work into it. It was my baby for like the last year. And I appreciate all the love on it. If you haven't read it, Go check that out. If you aren't subscribed to The Athletic, you can subscribe through that link right there. Click the link, subscribe, and you can go read all my practice reports from the last 19 days of training camp. Um, I watch with an eagle eye. I put every single observation I have in my notebook into those practice reports. I put as much detail as I possibly can. You guys know everything that I know going on at training camp because I put it all in those practice reports. So if you're a Chargers fan and you want – as much detail about this team as possible, I suggest you click that link below. 
subscribe, read this daily story, and then read all my practice reports because you're not going to get that type of info anywhere else. I can say that. So let's let's just get right into questions here. I'm sure you guys have a ton of questions because you know we haven't done one of these yet in training camp. So just fire away and we'll do some quick hitting questions. Let's just get to it. Have a beer together and, and hang out. That's what Hops and Pop is all about. Okay, it's a good question. You said in one of your updates the D-line looks good during last year's camp. The D-line looked noticeably weak. Curious about a direct comparison. It's really hard to get – it's a good question. It's really hard to get a read on, you know, how good a defensive line is, especially against the run in practices because they're not tackling a lot. And that is, like, probably the most important part about evaluating a run defense. It's like, how are you actually making these plays? So it's hard to come away and say, yeah, this thing is fixed. But in comparison to last year, it looks a lot better in terms of how they're fitting it up. And what that means is like where guys are plugging into lanes. So when you when you design a run defense, everyone is coached to play in a certain gap. And that way, if everyone's in their gap and fitting their gap, there should be no holes for the running back. That's the idea, right? And so, you know, you can you can get a read on that in training camp. Like, how are they fitting it up? You can't necessarily make a determination on the tackling, but you can say, okay, at least they're in the right spot. There aren't any glaring gaps in the defense. And that's what I saw in that Cowboys practice. That's what I've seen all camp long. And a lot of it stems from Sebastian Joseph Day, who is a fantastic run defender. He makes a huge difference in the middle. He's always in the right spot. He makes splash plays. He gets penetration. He does not get moved off his spot. He's super stout. And then you have Austin Johnson next to him, who's just another big body. And that's what this defense is all about from a run defense perspective is big bodies up front that can eat blocks and, and plug holes up there, not necessarily penetrating, but just eating blocks up front and allowing the linebackers and safeties to come in and, and make plays. And that's what we've seen. We've seen it time and time again. These big guys up front between Sebastian Joseph Day and Austin Johnson, Morgan Fox has looked really good, Otito Obonia, plugging holes up front, eating blocks, taking on double teams. And then you see Drew Tranquil, you see Troy Reader, you see Nasir Adderley penetrating and making plays. And a lot of what happened last year with the run defense is the, the interior defensive linemen were getting pushed off their spots. And so it was really hard for the linebackers and safeties to figure out exactly where they needed to be in the run fit so they, they could penetrate and make plays. Because if a, if a defensive lineman is getting pushed five yards in the backfield or is getting pushed five yards horizontally, all of a sudden that messes up the design of the run fit and, and the linebackers don't know where to be. And that was the biggest issue last year. And I think it affected how the linebackers played at times because the defensive linemen were just getting pushed off the ball so frequently. If that doesn't happen, and these def defensive linemen can, can maintain their positions, not get moved off the ball, and and be stout on the interior. It's going to allow these linebackers and, and safeties to make better decisions, know exactly where they're supposed to be, play faster. Um, and that's really what we're seeing so far through camp. So to answer the question, yeah, it does look a lot better. But we're not going to know for sure if this thing is fixed until we get to week one and we see them actually play in a real football game because a lot of these – Defensive linemen, starting defensive players aren't playing in the preseason. And on top of that, you know, the, the schematics in preseason are always super vanilla because teams don't want to give anything away. Um, and so it's still to, to be determined. But from what I've seen, it looks a lot better. And I think a lot of it stems from Sebastian Joseph Day. And then on top of that, a lot of it stems from Khalil Mack setting the edge. He's a fantastic, fantastic run defender. He's made a ton of plays in camp. And having that player there who's an elite run defender is going to change everything up front because. A lot of runs are, are, you know, with how much outside zone there is in the NFL, how many runs go to the edge, jet sweeps, all of that kind of action that you see in modern offenses. You need an edge player who can make plays out there, be stout out there, and also has the athleticism to track down runners to the edge and not give up that edge, which happened so many times last year. So positive, but we'll see. Uh, Jerry Tillery, a cut candidate? Nope. I, Jerry, Jerry Tillery is going to make this team. I, I've had a running 53 man going throughout camp and he's been on it the whole time. Um, just based on what the coaches say, I, I think he's going to be in a role that fits his skill set better. 
And so they're not going to be relying him on him playing as one of those two defensive linemen in four man front nickel packages. He's going to be able to come in on unknown passing downs and do what he does best, which is get after the quarterback. And he's actually pretty decent at that. You know, I don't think he's like an elite rusher, but he definitely brings some value as a pass rusher. It's the run defense that's really been an issue for him. Um, so I, I think he's going to make this roster because of that. I have him keeping six defensive linemen. I'm going to have my 53-man projection out on – it should be Friday night after the game. So you'll see the, the full the full 53-man projection there. Um, but, yeah, I do, I do have Tillery – uh, you know, making this roster. Uh, any surprise cut? Let me look through what I have. Um, I don't want to give too much away because I want you guys to actually read the 53 man. Um, but frankly, nothing, nothing super surprising. How are we feeling about Bandy? Michael Bandy looks like a legitimate NFL player to me. He's a really, 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 really good route runner. And he has ran these routes effectively against starting caliber players in the NFL, whether it was against the Cowboys or whether it's been against the Chargers defense. I just don't have a spot for him on the 53 man. Now, if he gets cut, we'll see if he clears waivers. Um, some of the tape that he's put out this preseason and the preseason games has been excellent. Obviously, you guys have seen the performances that he's had. So certainly a possibility that he gets picked up on waivers by somebody just based on how he's performed in the preseason. Um, the Chargers definitely really like him, but I just don't I don't have a spot for him right now. I've, I've got five wide receiver spots, and those are, are pretty much set with Keenan, Mike, Jalen Guyton, Josh Palmer, and then DeAndre Carter, who has been outstanding in camp as well. I just don't see him keeping a six receiver, despite the fact that Bandy's played really, really well. I think in a perfect world, Bandy clears waivers and he ends up on the practice squad. And if you do have an injury at receiver, you call him up. Um, but just based on how he's performed in the preseason, everyone's seen that tape and they see what kind of route runner he is. And, and there could be a team that is in need of a slot receiver that takes a shot at him. Uh, three quarterbacks, yeah. I think it's pretty obvious they're going to keep three quarterbacks. We can debate if it's the right decision, but that's what they're going to do. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of it stems from the fact that the, what Brandon Staley would call the quarterback environment, right, that they have, it's obviously working for Justin Herbert. So you don't want to do anything to disrupt that. And, you know, I, you know, Justin has talked about how valuable Easton Stick is in the film room. He's, he's very intelligent. Um, you know, Chase Daniel as a guy who's been in this offense before as a mentor, he's really important. And then, you know, you have Shane Day in there, you have, uh, offensive assistant Chandler Whitmer, who's effectively their assistant quarterbacks coach. A lot of it is the same and you want it. They've talked all off season about familiarity, about continuity. And, you know, those guys are a part of that because they're in there watching film every single week together. And so you don't want to disrupt it. That's the logic. Um, you know, I guess you have to you have to do a cost benefit analysis, right? Like, is the player you're going to keep over Easton Stick or Chase Daniel going to be more beneficial than those guys being in the film room with Justin Herbert? That's really the analysis that you're doing. And and to them, the value that those guys bring to that quarterback room is is more important than keeping whoever it is a fourth tight end, um, you know, another edge rusher. And and frankly, I don't think those players that they're thinking about keeping are are that essential. You know, a Jamal Davis. You know, Kimon Hall, guys like that. All right. So just to throw this out there, I'm not going to answer a lot of questions about my 53-man projection because I want you guys to read it. So Friday night that's coming out. I've answered everything that I'm going to answer about, you know, who's gonna, who I have making the roster and who I don't. I'll, I'll talk more generally about how players have performed, but I want you guys to read that. So. Okay, maybe one more question about it. Who wins the fullback battle? Uh, it's going to be Xander Horvath. Gabe Neighbors hasn't taken any fullback reps 
in the last like two weeks, he's been working exclusively with the tight ends. Um, Horvath is the only guy that's taking snaps at fullback. So that's pretty much decided. Um, and I think Horvath has come on particularly on special teams. You know, he's been working in with the first team special teams units. That's really going to be his role. I mean, when they drafted Xander Horvath, they're thinking, okay, how do we, how do we find Derek Watt? Derek Watt was a really important piece of this roster. He might not play a ton of snaps, but he was a really, really good special teams player. Um, okay. Frankie's having a, a meltdown over here. Please stop. We're doing a live stream. Okay. I will pet you later. So yeah, Derek Watt was a really, really important piece of these special teams. He, could play, he played fullback, obviously, and then he could play some tight end. And they've been looking for that player ever since Derek Watt left in free agency. They probably should have not let him walk and resigned him. Xander Horvath is a really similar profile to Derek Watt. You know, recruited out of high school as a linebacker. You know, shift to, to you know kind of tailback, halfback, fullback combination type guy at Purdue after he got recruited there and, and signed there, and. Um, but he has that defensive background, having played linebacker in high school. And, and and on top of that is a really, really excellent athlete at the position. You know, Derek Watt was also a really, really good athlete, speed, physicality, size, all that kind of stuff. Horvath ran like a 4 6 3, 40, So he has the type of speed to be on punt coverage, to be on kickoff coverage. And so, you know, I think they're hoping he'll develop into, you know, the same type of player that Derek Watt was. And, and he's going he's gonna to have that role to start the season. People are saying Herbert is struggling. Listen, if you want to doubt Justin Herbert, go for it. Like, be my guest. But I will never be that person. But to add context, like, I think, yeah, you're seeing some more interceptions. You're seeing some incompletions. Sure. However, I think that is Justin Herbert testing the limits in practice. You know, the great quarterbacks are going to push the limit. A lot of stories about Patrick Mahomes doing this, Aaron Rodgers you know, in practice, making throws that you would never make in a game just to see what you can get away with. Right. And so he's trying to throw into tighter windows, just seeing what he's capable of, what he can get away with. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Like we know what Justin Herbert is. He's a top five quarterback in the league. And so if he's throwing interceptions in practice, it doesn't mean he's taking a step back. There's obviously something else at play. And it, I, and it's him, you know, pushing the ball into tighter windows and taking these chances just to see what he can he can get away with and to have a better idea of where the limits are once he gets on the field in the, in the, in the regular season. Uh, why is Staley noncommittal on the right tackle still? I have no idea. It's a great question. But it's going to be Trey Pipkins. I mean, he took all the first team reps this week. So that was the first time – all training camp that they that's that Storm and Trey didn't split reps. They had Storm Norton working at left tackle with the second team. So all the signs are there. It's pretty obvious to me that Trey's won this job. Why he won't uh, say it publicly, I don't know. Uh, thoughts on Zion Johnson in the preseason? Yeah, he's he's a real player. Um, his run blocking is outstanding. Like he's going to be an elite run blocker from day one. Um, you know, there's been some things in pass protection that haven't been you know maybe as seamless as Rashawn Slater's transition from college to the pros. Um, you know, in the first Cowboys practice, there were some stunts and games that threw him off a little bit. Um, so I think the pass protection side of it is going to be more of a work in progress. The the run blocking though is elite already. Um, and that's really why they drafted him. I mean, you know, obviously you want to keep Justin Herbert protected, but a big part of this was the fact that they could not run the ball to the right side last year. Like they could really only run the ball effectively to the left side. And so bringing in Zion Johnson, right. And, and Trey Pipkins is a really good run blocker as well. But you bring in Zion Johnson, and all of a sudden it allows you to run right, it allows you to run left, it allows you to have more balanced running game. And so if that that that's a big part of the vision for him when they drafted him. And so if that if he's going to have that from day one, then it's a huge win for the organization. Someone asked me about the thumbnail. What did I do? A bad thumbnail. What happened? What happened with the thumbnail? Someone tell me.
No, it's fine. Okay. So how has Kyle Van Noy looked, and how are you seeing him used? So he's been playing exclusively inside linebacker, so they haven't really used him as an edge rusher, but I think the way you'll see it expressed, to use a daily word, when they actually get on the field in the regular season is they might line up with three down linemen, one edge rusher, and then two inside linebackers, Drew Tranquil and Kyle Van Noy, and then leave this spot open. And then Kyle Van Noy might move to edge rusher and, and, and come off the edge. And that creates some disguise because you don't know if he's going to be playing off the ball and playing in coverage. You don't know if he's going to be coming up the middle on a blitz, or you don't know if he's going to come off the edge. So that's what Kyle Van Noy gives you is flexibility to play off the ball as an inside linebacker or to play on the edge. And I think you're going to be seeing him doing both things. Like, I don't think it's going to be a, okay, he's at edge rusher on this play. He's at inside linebacker at this play. You're going to be able to move him pre-snap to create some disguise and confuse opposing quarterbacks. That's a lot of what this defense is about. And that's why I think Kyle Van Noy is a really good fit. Um, I think with him, it's going to come down to health. He's a little bit of an older player. Can he stay on the field? Um, and you know, he's looked good so far, but that's just training cramp practices. And we'll have to see what happens when the game starts. Now the sun's going down. It's getting a little dark. Is that better? Well, it's right. We've got some lighting issues here and hops will pop. I don't know if that's actually any better. Let's try these lights. That feels better. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Lighting master. Hey, everyone can see me now. All right, what else we got? Show Frankie. He doesn't necessarily like being picked up, so we're not going to do that. But he, hopefully you guys can hear him whining in the background. Did I watch the Manti Teo documentary? No, it's on my list of things to do. Do I think Rump, Chris Rumpf will play meaningful snaps? Yes, absolutely. He's going to be the third edge rusher, and I think he's looked fantastic in camp so far in these preseason games. Like what you want out of, out of your guys that are going to be contributors if they're playing in the preseason games, you want to see him dominate. You want to see him dominate in the preseason against against backups and guys who are going to be you know on the street in, in two weeks. And you saw Josh Palmer do that on Saturday. And you've seen Chris Rump do it in both these games as a pass rusher. And just as importantly, as a run defender, um, he added some weight this off season. He's gotten stronger. You know, last year he, um, you know, he, he was some of his pass rush moves and then in run defense, he just wasn't that stout, but you kind of expected that just considering his frame coming out of college, you know, he's matured a little bit physically. And I think you're seeing that show up in how he's playing. And so he's going to be a key piece in this defense, you know, because edge rushers aren't going to play hundred percent of the defensive snaps. So he's going to play meaningful snaps. And, and I think he's going to have a big year. And I've been saying that since, I don't know, February, you know, cause I really liked what I saw on tape from him last year. And, you know, you, you, you do the math or well, not the math, but you, you think about it and you say, okay, he has the, he has the motor. He has, you know, the tenacity to play out there. Um, if he adds a little bit of weight and adds some strength, you know, some of that stuff is going to translate a little bit more on a more consistent basis. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, potential exotic look lineup I'd be excited to see. I mean, Derwin's moving all over the place. And now that JC Jackson is out, I think you're going to see it. Well, is he's, he's missing practice right now, but if he were to miss regular season games, I think you're going to see a lot of Derwin in the slot, but those are the lineups that I'm really excited to see is just when Derwin moves around, they wanted to play him in the slot a lot last year, but you know, with all the injuries they had, they just couldn't do it. 
Um, you know, Chris Harris went down and he was going to be the guy that was going to move to safety when Derwin went to the slot. That plan got thrown out the window once Chris Harris got injured. And then you had Nas miss games. You had Alohi Gilman miss games and then Michael Davis miss games and then Asante miss games. And you just never had, you know, all of these defensive backs on the field at the same time. So I don't think we saw Derwin in the slot nearly as much as they, they had planned going into the season. And so I am excited to see lineups where Derwin is close to the football because when he's close to the football, he makes stuff happen. And so, you know, the, one of the cool things about him playing in the slot is it's really easy for him to then blitz, right? If he's in the slot, all it takes is one shuffle right or left, depending on which side he's in. And all of a sudden he's on the edge and he can get after the quarterback. And he is a real difference maker when he's blitzing and getting after the quarterback. So you know, those are the lineups that I'm really excited to see is when they move Derwin close to the football in the slot and, and allow him to make plays. Is everything good with the audio, guys? I'm, I'm seeing some people uh, complaining. Audio is good. All right, cool. All right, let's keep it rolling. Uh, how has Khalil Mack looked? He's looked fantastic. I think with him, it's just going to be about health. Like, can he stay on the field? If he's on the field, he's going to be a difference maker in this defense. That's that's very evident to me based on how he's played so far. Uh, worried about Dean Leonard and JT Woods, not necessarily Dean Leonard. You know, he was a, a seventh round pick and you know, he was always going to have a battle to make the roster. I'd be a little more concerned about JT Woods. I, um, I'm concerned about his tackling and that was a weakness in his game in college. It was a reason why a lot of people had fourth, fifth round grades on him coming out of Baylor. Obviously he, he gets the football. He had amazing ball production in college. He's got track speed, four, three, six speed. You know, he, he operates well in the deep part of the field, but you have to be able to tackle at this level playing safety, especially in this scheme where you have split safeties and both guys are going to be, um, you know, close to the line of scrimmage at different at different points, depending on the package, depending on the play call. You know, they believe that, you know, they're going to put him in positions where he doesn't he, he doesn't have to make tackles and he's really only operating in the deep part of the field and putting a roof on the coverage. But I don't know if you can trust him right now. And so that means that Alohi Gilman is going to be your main second safety coming on when they go to dime package and move Derwin James to the money position, which is like a safety linebacker hybrid position. Alohi's had a really good camp. He's better in all facets than JT Woods right now. He doesn't have the athleticism, obviously, um, or the speed, right? But that's a guy that I trust a lot more than JT Woods. So I don't know if it's a huge loss for the defense. I think they could have gone a different direction with that pick. They are still really high on JT Woods, and they think he's going to develop. But I think early on in the season, when they go to these six DB packages, it's going to be Alohi Gilman coming on as that second safety, and they're just going to have to give JT Woods some time to develop. But it's still so early in his career. Like I'm not writing, I'm not writing the player off. Um, I just think that you know the vision they had in terms of his contributions as a rookie. I don't really see that happening early on, at least, um, just because of his his issues as a tackler. Um, and so we'll see how that plays out. But he's long. He's got outstanding speed, and obviously he had ball production in college. And so you, you, you think those things would translate if you can coach him up and get him to a point where you can trust him as a tackler. Do I think tackling is teachable? So interesting question, because I asked the same question to, to Brandon Staley on Monday. And I also feel like I asked the question to Ronaldo, but they think that it's, co it's coachable. And they've coached a lot more football than I have, because I haven't coached any football. So, you know, they feel like they can put him in positions in practice where they can coach him up and, and, and get him in a position where he's making tackling. They feel like he has the physical tools and, and, 
Most importantly, they feel like that he has the willingness to go make tackles, and that's a big part of it. I haven't necessarily seen that in the games and practices, but they're around him a lot more than I am, and they believe that he's a willing tackler, and it's just more about technique and angles and putting himself in the right positions. Um, and so we'll see. I mean, a lot of this with JT Woods is like, we'll see. You can say it's coachable. You can say that you can put him in a better position to be a better tackler, but you sort of have to see that translate before I can say, okay, yeah, like it's definitely a coachable thing with this player. Uh, do the Chargers have a good running back too yet? Not yet. Not yet. You know, I think they really wanted Isaiah Spiller to have a great camp and take that job, and that hasn't happened. Burps. Joshua Kelly was having a really good camp, but I think he took a step back in the preseason game. Um, he also had a fumble in the Cowboys practice, which has been an issue for him in his career. I don't think that Larry Roundtree has a ton of juice. I just, I'm seeing the same stuff from him as a runner where it's just, it's first contact and he's down. And if he's going to be that type of back where he doesn't have a ton of long speed and he's going to be more of a, of a, of a physical bruiser, he has to break more tackles and he has to be more physical at the point of attack. And like, I just haven't seen that from him. Like there was a swing pass in the, in the Cowboys preseason game where he caught in the flat, he had a couple defenders in front of him and he should have been able to take that for a three, four yard gain and break a couple tackles and at least power through a couple tackles and fall forward. And he got dropped to the line of scrimmage. So I don't think he is the answer. So again, it's a question mark again. I don't think they figured it out. You know, I, I said in the off season that, you know, I thought it would have been a good idea to at least go get a veteran who has a proven level of play in the league and can, and can provide some sort of reliability. And they didn't do that. And now they're kind of in a similar position where they don't really have a good answer behind Austin Eckler. And they're going to be searching for this thing early on in the season, potentially all season long, like they did last year. So we'll see. And, and, you know, the other part of it is that Isaiah Spiller is dealing with this ankle injury. He might be out for week one. We'll see what happens there. It's never a good thing when a rookie is missing practice time and dealing with injuries early on in his career. So I'm not super bullish on the entire situation. Um, and I think Isaiah Spiller is a really talented back, but that ankle injury is, is preventing him from practicing right now. So we're going to have to see how that plays out, but I'm, I'm not terribly confident in that group right now. Otito and Fajoko. So I, you know, I think Bra Braden Fajoko is a really good player. Period. Early on in his career, he was really just a run stuffer and didn't have much as a pass rusher. But I, I really was impressed with, with what I saw from him in in the pass rush one on ones, particularly in the Cowboys practice. He just plays with a tenacity. He plays with an energy that's starting to show up in his pass rush as well. He was just getting after people in the pass rush one on ones, and and he's and he's a proven run defender. Um, so you know, I don't know if he's going to get a ton of playing time early on in the season. Uh, but I think he ought to be a part of the rotation. And then with Otito, he, Tito is just a big body. I think we've seen some really good stuff from him in run defense, just with size and stoutness, the kind of stuff we were talking about earlier. Um, he's got some some improving to do as a pass rusher, but that's not necessarily why they drafted him. They didn't need that type of contribution from him early on in the season. Um, he does have a great motor with his pass rush. So some of the things that jumped out to me in, in the one-on-ones was his initial moves weren't great. He was getting beat initially. Um, with his hands, with his get off. Um, but he did have a great motor and he really powered through in the second half of the rep to really create pressure. Um, and so that, that's something that you can't teach. It's something that Chris Rump has as well. So, you know, with a little more polish, with a little more work in that part of his game, that'll, that'll develop, but they really just need him to be a big body run stuffer. And I think he's, he's lived up to that bill so far in camp. Has Spiller impressed me? Yeah, Isaiah Spiller has a really, really impressive skill set. Um, he's just smooth, really smooth on his routes, really smooth with his vision and cuts when he has the ball in his hands on handoffs. Um, he's got great hands to catch the football out of the backfield. Um, so he's got everything that you want. Um, we just haven't really seen it pop in, in practice or these preseason games, and, and now he's dealing with his ankle injury. 
I, I think he, you know, if he didn't have this ankle injury, I think that, you know, he would, t- he would take this job over pretty quickly early on in the season. Um, but, but right now he's not on the practice field. He's going to miss this game on Friday. Um, and, you know, Staley said that there's a chance he can miss week one. So it's going to set him back a little bit. And, you know, potentially one of these guys takes the reins in this RB2 battle early on in the season. And we'll see what happens with Isaiah Spiller. But definitely has an impressive skill set. And I think he's going to be a really good player. Just my only question mark is, you know, how effective he can be early on in the season. It's hot in here. That'd be the AC. I'm schwitzing. I saw a good question earlier. Let me find it again. It was like... Pops predictions is like most catch, most passing touchdowns or most receiving touchdowns, sacks. I can't find it. If you ask that question, re ask it because I thought it was a good question. Okay, special teams. Like, I mean, a lot of special teams questions. Um, Oh, okay. Sacks, touchdowns, tackles. All right, it's a good question. Sacks, I'm going with Joey Bosa. Touchdowns, I'm going with Austin Eckler. And tackles, I'm going with Drew Tranquil. And then special teams. So, listen, I, I wouldn't put too much stock in in what happened in that Cowboys game. Um, One part of it is they're going to be having more starters playing on these coverage units. That's going to include Nas Adderley and Drew Tranquil and Michael Davis at Gunner. I think that's going to help a lot. The special teams unit really improved over the second half of last year. Um, And that was a lot of young guys. And those guys are coming into their second year. It is a new scheme, obviously, with Ryan Fick and the new special teams coordinator. But a lot of these guys just have more experience, whether it's Nick Neiman, whether it's Eamon Ogbong Mamiga. You know, and you go down the list of guys that, that, you know, got significant reps last year. And so I think think they're going to be better. On top of that, you have Josh Harris as your long snapper now on punt coverage, who's an all-pro player and get down the field and make plays, which is something they didn't have last year. You bring in Troy Reader, who is a super experienced special teams player. That's how he's made his name in this in this league. And so you feel like he's going to bring a lot to your special teams. And so we'll see what happens. I think it's going to be better. But really, you just need to be like league average on special teams. With the offense they have, if they can be league average on special teams and league average on defense, they're going to be a really good football team. And so you, you don't need elite play out of those two units because your offense is so good. And I think that's been the idea here. So with Josh Harris, with Troy Reader, when you get Drew Tranquil on special teams, you have Nas Adderley playing there. You get Michael Davis on the field. You get some of these starters playing on special teams. You get improvement from some of the players that were really young last year and made a lot of young mistakes, whether, you know, Nick Neiman and Eamon Ogbong Mamiga, right? And, and you can understand why, you know, there's some feeling internally that it's going to be better this year. So we'll see. but. There's always a question mark um, when you have a unit that hasn't performed and you have a new special teams coordinator. But, you you know, on top of that, you have DeAndre Carter, who's been a really good returner in this league for a long time. So you, they have a lot of the pieces that you're looking for. And then I think playing a lot of starters on special teams is going to help um, because Brandon Staley knows that that unit has to be a lot better this year. All right. Beer's done. I will take three more questions. I always forget the catchphrase, but when the hops are done, pop is done. Something like that. I forget it. Three more questions. Uh, Kenneth Murray update. He's back at practice. He was back in 11 on 11 today. 
for the first time since he was removed from the pup list. And we'll see what kind of role he can carve out for himself. You know, I, I you know, last year I think that they were trying to develop a role for him where they were going to maximize what he does best, which is play downhill and use his speed and violence to make plays. Um, and we'll see if they're able to carve that role out this year. I think the key for him is just staying healthy, like be in practice every single week, be available on game day every single week, you know, avoid some of these injuries that have been affecting his play, whether it was the shoulder injury in his rookie year, whether it was the ankles last year, you know, if he can just stay healthy, I think you can see, you can, you, you can see him being a productive player. If they sort of you know, put him in this hyper specific role where he's blitzing a lot, where he's able to play downhill um, and we'll see what happens. But right now it's Drew Tranquil and Kyle Van Noy as the starting inside linebackers. Uh, Kenneth Murray is probably like th- him and Troy Reader are like three A and three B on the depth chart right now. Um, and so he's going to have to work to, to earn snaps with those two guys playing over him. Um, but, you know, the Chargers still believe in the skill set. You know, they still believe in the skill set and, and you see it. You know, when he's out on the field, just his athleticism is is why he was a first round pick. And and we'll see if this coaching staff can get the most out of him. But the number one thing is he's just got to be able to stay on the field, start there. And then you can see what happens, because if you can't stay on the field, then you can't start designing roles for him uh, because you can't rely on him. So that's number one. Stay on the field, be in practice and then see if he, he can carve out a role for himself, um, maybe as a special teams player. I haven't seen him out there yet, but obviously he's only been at three practices. Um, and then maybe in some of these designer packages, dime packages where he can, you know, get after the quarterback and and play downhill. We'll see what happens. Seeing some Xander Horvath questions. I already talked about Horvath earlier. Uh, how good do I think Jasir Taylor can be? I think he'd be really, really good. I think he'd be really, really good. Um, He's going to be a factor on special teams early on as a gunner. Um, and then they've been playing him primarily in the slot. And I think he's he's got really good instincts on the inside in the slot. He's really good on at defending out routes out of the slot, which is a big part of playing in there. And he had an interception today of Justin Herbert defending DeAndre Carter in the slot, jumped the out route, something he's been doing all all training camp long. I think they got a steal there in the sixth round and just see a t- and just – Jasir Taylor, Jasir, that's how you pronounce it. Um, and yeah, he's going to be really good depth for them. He can play inside, he can play outside, he can play um, some money in dime packages as well. And so he's he's kind of fits that mold of what Staley is looking for. Super versatile, defensive back with some ball skills, um, can really play man-to-man in the slot. And I think he's going to be a really good depth piece for this team this year. And, and we'll see how his career develops. All right, one more question. Do I think JC's injury will linger throughout the year? No, this is not a serious thing. I think Brandon Staley said it pretty explicitly today. They did the surgery. There's nothing structurally wrong in the ankle. They're waiting for the wound to heal where they made the incision for the surgery. And as soon as that heals, he's going to be good to go. Um, Now, when that is, we'll see. Could be before the Raiders game. Could be after the Raiders game. Could be after the Kansas City game. But he'll be back within four weeks. I think he's back for that Jaguars game at the latest, and then they'll be, they'll be off and rolling. So I know you guys had a meltdown on Monday about the injury, but it's really not a big issue, and um, he'll be back soon and won't miss too much time in the regular season, and then they'll have the full defense out there, and they'll be rolling. So. All right, guys, I appreciate everyone joining. Um, we will do the post-game hops, hops with Pop during the season. So those, these will be back to uh, a more regular schedule once the regular season starts. Um, if you are not subscribed to The Athletic, click that link below. Subscribe. That's a feature I did on analytics, how the Chargers use it, how Brandon Steele use it. It's a behind-the-scenes look. So make sure you go check that out if you haven't read it before. Appreciate you all for joining. We'll do this again soon. Peace out.